thanks for letting us join you. Thanks to Mitch, Eric, others, members of the board, the growers. I really appreciate being here. So we have a panel of disease experts. And certainly Michael Bunch has been here before. You know him pretty well. I think you know me fairly well, but we've got three relatively new faces to introduce you to. So the vision of this is to show you some of the researchers that are on the front lines of disease research, but often, often in the shadows a bit, and they're all working for you. So each of the researchers up here has some funding from North Harvest for at least one project. I'll introduce them briefly, and then I'll, I'll sit down with them. And ha I have a few questions, and then if we have time and there's interest, I'd love to take a few questions from you all. So starting on the far side, we have Dr. Michael Bunch. Michael joined NDSU in 2010, yes, 2010? 2010, so he's looking forward to his 13th, 14th field season. So he received his PhD at Cornell, and among other things, Michael's been working on white mold for a very long time. And he's really, his data has really changed the way we look at management. And so one of the things you probably don't know about Michael, and he won't tell you, is that for, I would say, six to seven weeks in the summer, five days a week, probably 10 hours a day, Michael is literally crawling through dry bean and soybean plots measuring white mold, right? Is that right, Michael? Yeah. So for all of you, I did a little math. So none of us in this room work 40 hours a week, but if we did, that would be two full years of work that Michael has crawled on his knees looking at white mold. Thank you, Michael. <laughs> so next to Michael is Dr. Upender Gill. So Dr. Gill joined NDSU in 2019. He's a rust pathologist. So his sole focus of his program is rusts and particularly genetics. He's been working on genetics for common bean rust now for a couple years since he's been here. Dr. Malika Abert is next to Dr. Gill. She's the newest member of the group. She joined NDSU just over a year ago and she's the new bean and pulse pathologist. So you may remember Julie Pashi. Julie Pashi is still at NDSU, but she's now in an endowed chair's position. So Dr. Abert is following her up. She, got, she is originally from Germany, got her PhD in Europe at a university I can't pronounce very well called Wachenaken. Um, it's an agricultural university really well known for, for helping growers with what they're doing. She's starting up her program, so I'll ask her a couple questions about what she's planning in the future, among other things. And then last but not least is Dr. Guiping Yan. So she joined NDSU in 2014. She's a nematologist. So her whole world is looking at primarily microscopic plant parasitic worms. A couple years ago, she started working on soybean cyst nematode in dry edible beans. And so for those of you that remember Dr. Berlin Nelson, our soybean pathologist, he recently retired. Dr. Yan is taking over a lot of that dry edible, uh, dry edible bean work. So I think I'll sit down with the panel and ask a few questions. I think the first one, I think I'm gonna start with Dr. Gill. So he's the rust pathologist. And part of it's because rust has been on my mind, particularly in relatively dry years. So Dr. Gill, you work on genetics for rust. Could you tell us a little bit about what you're doing with rust? Sure. Thank you, Dr. Marco. And thank you, everyone, for inviting me to the panel. So as Dr. Marco mentioned, so I'm a rust pathologist. So I work on like uh, rust disease of economically important crops of North Dakota, for example, wheat, dry bean, and any other crop that gets the rust uh, pathogen or rust disease. So on dry bean, I am focusing on uh, mainly three aspects. So first thing means we say that know your enemies. So I want to actually look at what kind of rust uh, isolates or rust races are present in North, Har North Harvest region. So because, and that involves disease scouting, bringing the uh, pathogen in the lab and test in the greenhouse for what type of races those are. And then if, so I'm a DNA guy, so I work on the, look at the DNA side of plants and the pathogens. So I also try to understand at uh, DNA level if there are differences within the races. That is important because uh, if we know uh, the pathogen, then we can better prepare for it and breed for uh, resistant varieties with uh, in Dr. Uh, Juan Osorno's program. And the second aspect is uh, uh, in collabor collaboration with Dr. Osorno, look for uh, resistance. If there are any novel sources, sources of resistance against 
these rust pathogens and then uh, help uh, breeding program incorporate new resistance or novel resistance sources in the new newly released uh, cultivars. And the third aspect is as a as a grower, we need to know like whether if we put a resistance gene in, is that going to be economically helpful to the farmers? So for that, I work with Dr. Uh, Markel on understanding if we uh, do the field trials and try to understand if we can. Uh, with the lines with the resistance gene or without resistance gene, is there any economical benefit? Can we get the yield advantage? And just those kind of studies. So those are the three, uh, three aspects I mainly work on. So many of you growers will remember rust epidemics maybe in the 80s and 90s, and a lot of that, of course, was related to the pathogen changing races and overcoming genes. So not to put you on the spot, Dr. Gill, but we know that can happen. We know that does happen. So what, what do you think the threat of rust is maybe in the next five years? And maybe what, if you are very successful, what would you expect for some of the knowledge of the genetics and varieties? So uh, I would say rust is something that can uh, come next year or it cannot come in next few years because uh, so the thing is, this pathogen is evolving very fast, so there are always something going on. It is coming up, making some changes in the, in the genome and then coming up with the new races, so we need to be always prepared for it. And usually, I think, uh, as I said, disease scouting is very important, as long as we can just keep, on, keep our eyes open looking for any, any changes in the pathogen, we can be on a safer side and we can work with the breeding programs and try to introduce new genes against those races. So. Yeah, you mentioned scouting. How would you recommend uh, one of the growers in the room scout for rust? Yeah, so usually I think that's a very important question. So if we are uh, scouting for rust diseases, mainly like when uh, there is a prolonged dew period and uh, closed canopy, uh, moderate temperature, that is the time, those are the conducive environment for the rust to uh, take place or to cause the infection. And usually, uh, uh, like uh, after 4th of July, like mid or later July is the time when we can see like those hot spots in the field. If you see anything, just, I would suggest like uh, just contact uh, extension agents or send your sample to disease diagnostic lab or just contact us anytime, like you can contact us on phone, email, or just stop by our office and bring the samples in. So those are the things I would suggest. All right, thank you. So Dr. Abert, you're the newest member of the team here, so just finished your first field season. So one of the things I know you do is you do a disease survey, and this has been going on for many years, and this is your first go at it. So can you tell us what you saw this year in your survey, a little bit about the survey? Thank you for the introduction. Um, this was my first uh, survey this year, that is true. Of course, yeah. And um, what we did was we uh, surveyed fields in North Dakota and Minnesota, so the North Harvest region. Um, we, in total, went to 30 fields, and uh, we used three time points to scout for different diseases, so root rots, um, bacterial diseases, but also white mold and rusts. And in general, what we found was, um, I think that is also something that people saw in previous years, that root rots are very common in the fields. So in 30 fields, we found 100% of root rot. Every field ha had it. Um, and similar was also common bacterial blight. It was very commonly found. We did take samples with uh, to process in the lab because we're always interested in staying up to date with the, the pathogens that we actually find in the fields. Um, something else that we found was a uh, brown spot, actually a little bit higher than the previous years. I went back to the old reports and saw that generally it's, it was always between 5% and 30%, but this year it was nearly 93%. So we also sampled a lot of that and uh, we are currently processing those in the lab. Um, besides that, we found a little bit of white mold and also a little bit of rusts, <laughs> which we handed off to Dr. Gill. 
Um, and yeah, in general, I would like to thank uh, the driving community for being very nice to us and very welcoming. We had some interactions in the field and that was a really, really nice experience when people actually came out. Uh, they saw us in the field, they came out, they asked questions, they told me, uh, told us about their, their fields, about what they grow, and that is very valuable for us in general. Excellent. So I understand, too, that during the survey, you're collecting pathogen isolates. Mm -hmm. Part of that is to start and establish a pathology program that will work on multiple diseases, because you're the bean pathologist, right? So not to put you on the spot, but like, what do you think your program could look like five years from now? Um, that is a very good question, and actually what I learned uh, within the last year is to expect the unexpected. Um, so basically what we do is we try to make a very broad basis for a lot of different pathogens. For sure, root rot's going to be one part of it. Um, absolutely, uh, uh, bacterial diseases will be part of it, but also um, uh, white mold is very, very important for some parts of the North Harvest region. Um, rusts, we, uh, <laughs> we collaborate with uh, Dr. Gill, um, and by that I mean we just give him the samples. <laughs> <laughs> um, and in general, also, uh, Kölletetrichum is something we're always aware of, but um, that will also be in the line of research we, we will like to do in the future. Um, our research is set up that we look at the pathogen side, and then every results that we have, we will pass on to plant breeding, to Dr. Sono, who does the magic with the beans, and uh, hope that we can contribute to uh, finding durable resistance. All right, thank you, thank you. So let's move to Dr. Jan. You've been working on soybean cyst for a long time, but not so long on dry beans. So a couple of years on dry beans. And like I mentioned earlier, you're following up the work of Berlin Nelson. And so I'm curious if you could tell the North Harvest growers a little bit about SCN and what it means to the dry bean growers in the state. And then we'll maybe talk about your work a little more. Hello, everyone. Yeah, my name is Gui Ping Yan, so I'm a nematologist. You know, thank you, Sam, for nice introduction. Yeah, I have been working on SCN for years, but uh, to dry bean, I started uh, my research work in 2021. Uh, so in the past, uh, Dr. Billy Nelson had been working on dry bean and ICN. ICN, I, you know, so many soybean and growers know this pathogen. This is the number one disease in soybean. No, soybean cyst nematode is a very small, very tiny uh, microscopic work, uh, worm. It can be seen with naked eye uh, on infected uh, plants, but could be seen better and a microscope or in the field with you know, hand lens. So very small um, cyst. Usually we call the soybean cyst, cyst the common structure present in the field. A cyst structure is kind of very hardy. It can, can protect its progeny inside the cyst. So one cyst, you could find a maximum 600, 500 eggs, less potential in our column in the field. Then, you know, when uh, spring comes, those uh, eggs could hatch, and then find, you know, host plant root, and then infect the root. It is soil-bound pathogen, you know, present in the soil, attack the root. Once they get to inside the root, they kind of, you know, feeding on, on plant roots, and then take water and nutrients from plant roots and cause damaging on plant. So this is the way how they cause uh, yield loss on soil bean. And for dry bean, you know, so, um, it is a good host. So far in this region, soybean and dry bean are two uh, cash crops susceptible to soybean cyst nematode. And uh, this uh, uh, soybean cyst nematode was first detected in commercial field in dry bean in Minnesota in 2016. So in that field, a lot of um, damage has occurred. So uh, it's first detected in 2016. Uh, in 2019, you know, it was uh, uh, found, you know, uh, about 60% uh, of 
dry bean field are infested with soybean seed nematode, which indicate ICN is great potential threat on dry bean production. So you mentioned that field in Minnesota, that was a kidney field, right? Yes. And some of your work is looking at the difference between market classes and their susceptibility. Could you talk about that a little bit? Yes, yeah, we work on um, uh, screening some dry bean germplasm varieties and breeding lines in cooperation with uh, Dr. Wang Asano to look at uh, uh, resistant levels in dry bean for uh, soybean cyst uh, nematode. Mm -hmm. So, and uh, we test a different market class like a kidney bean, black bean, and uh, also uh, a pinto navy bean. So, like I mentioned, we just started this program. So, from our testing, you know, we found you know, many of them are susceptible or moderately susceptible to uh, ICN infection with new uh, virulent ICN population. From Berlin's uh, Dr. Berlin Nelson group, they did uh, quite you know extensive research on a different market class and ICN. What they found, you know. Kidney seems the most susceptible to ICN, and the black bean as a whole is kind of more resistant to ICN. You know, navy and the pinto kind of in between. So it could be, you know, has very variable very reaction to ICN infection. Could be moderately resistant, moderately susceptible, or susceptible. Okay, so kidneys are probably the most sensitive, blacks are the least sensitive, and the others are in the middle. Yes, yeah. you're so, right. And you're working with Dr. Osorno, working some of the genetics in or trying to identify resistance. Five years from now, what do you think? Yeah. I know that's maybe more of a breeding question. Sorry, Juan, but. <laughs> yeah, even I talked uh, with uh, Dr. Osorno you know, this uh, morning, I said we found many uh, breeding lines uh, susceptible or moderately susceptible to SCN, what we could do about this. I think, you know, uh, before 2015, from Berlin's work, it's focused on H type zero. It's kind of, you know, uh, a risk, a uh, population least virulent on uh, uh, dry bean. But uh, uh, with uh, more uh, uh, production or continue to use the same cultivar, more virulent population developed over years. So uh, in after 2015, we found more virulent population of ICN. For example, 257, as one mentioned, and 1257 is more virulent population. Those have you know, great uh, uh, potential, I mean, susceptible, uh, Dry bean or germplasm uh, breeding lines may be more susceptible to those uh, new population. So we really want to look at different sorts of resistance, resistance in dry bean, either from breeding line, breeding uh, program, or from a USDA core collection. We're trying to expand you know, screening, trying to find uh, germplasm with improved genetic resistance. So we can have resistance not only to H type zero, but to the new uh, ICM population. It's better, would be better to have a uh, combined resistance to multiple races of SCN. Okay, thank you very much. And I guess I would add on SCN, we know SCN is expanding into the dry bean region, and it is important to take a look for it. Like Dr. Ann mentioned, it's very small to see, so soil sampling is what we would recommend. And if you get it and you're growing soybeans, manage it as best you can on your soybeans because there are good tools at the moment. And the dry bean tools will improve, like Dr. Ian said. Okay, so moving to Dr. Wunsch. Okay, so saved you kind of for last, Michael. <laughs> so over the last more than a decade, you've crawled through a lot of beans. You've made a lot of progress. And some of your work is pretty amazing. You've optimized many things, timing, droplet size, nozzles, a lot of efficacy data, production practices. What do you think is the most important update you have for the growers? Would it be timing? How could they, if you could summarize any optimization thing that you think is really critical, what would that, what would that one thing be? Yeah, no, it's, it's hard to say just one thing. Um, 
you can have one to. thing that I would like to make sure that everyone is aware of is um, we did row spacing and seating rate work um, quite extensively for three years on pinto beans and kidney beans. The easiest thing that you can do from our research to manage white mold is on your problem fields be at the lower end of that normal seeding rate. So your pintos and kidneys you seed at 70,000 viable seeds an acre, not at 90,000. Okay, the impact on yield potential was negligible, but white mold was a lot lower at the lower seeding rate, and it didn't matter your row spacing. It was always the same story. The space between plants matters a lot for white mold on dry beans, much more than soybeans, okay? Um, the next thing that I would say that we have learned that I'd say has been a real game changer, we did this first on soybeans, and now we are following up on dry beans. <clears throat> And this is the idea that applying your white mold fungicides with fine droplets may not always be optimal, okay? Uh, on soybeans, we saw extraordinarily strong response to calibrating droplet size to canopy closure. We're following that up on, I mean, to the extent, I mean, you're we, were, we, were, we, we regularly increased our yield gain from our fungicide by 50 to 100%, and that means up to doubling the yield response to the fungicide just by getting your droplet size right. You're not spending really any more money here, okay? Maybe you have to get one extra set of tips, but if you take care of them, that's a one-time one investment for a few years. And... Um, and the growers I've talked to who have implemented this have seen the exact same thing that we saw, okay? Um, we're doing that on dry beans now. The kidney beans, I think we're the farthest along in that research, and they appear to be holding up exactly like the soybeans, okay? Um, uh, and almost all of our studies in this case, our kidney beans are about 80, 90, maximum 95% canopy closure at app A, i.e. you can still see some dirt between the rows, okay? And um, uh, between five and 20% of the ground still showing between the rows at app A. And then on app B, they're getting a lot closer to closure. And in those situations, you're optimizing with medium followed by coarse droplets on a T-jet nozzle, okay? And the nozzle manufacturer matters because as you go across manufacturers, there is not a standard definition of what a medium or a coarse droplet is in terms of what that company considers, okay? So Wilger, for instance, always runs a little bit finer than TGIT, okay? And um, on Pintos, we are still in the process of figuring out when you need to be applying which droplet. Um, half of our studies, we are optimizing with fine followed by medium droplets. App A versus App B, uh, and half our study is medium followed by coarse. Uh, in this case, it did not break down by the, our estimates of percent canopy closure, uh, and that might have been maybe some imperfect note-taking on our part, or maybe there's something else at play. We're following up on that. But you notice something, that you have to get a coarser droplet as your canopy gets denser. It's not fine followed by fine. No, it's fine followed by medium. Okay, so if you start off with fine, if that was optimal at app A, then medium was optimal at app B. And if you started on medium, you had to go coarse on app B. And so as the canopy closed more, it got more dense, you needed to go to a coarser droplet. And if this actually makes a tremendous amount of sense uh, if you think about it. Uh, our recommendations for fungicides have always been based on trying to control a disease on the top of the canopy, okay? Uh, and fine droplets give you excellent coverage for a product that has only limited systemic movement. The problem with white mold is that it doesn't infect on the top of the canopy. As the canopy gets denser and gets more closed, it gets harder to get a fine drop, but inside, okay? And so, 
as the canopy gets denser and more closed, you need a droplet that has more velocity and more weight to get inside, all right? And you want to be just coarse enough that you can get inside and no coarser, okay? So if you go in with ultra-coarse droplets, you're going to get inside, but you have no coverage, right? And so, uh, and that's why the spectrum that we're talking about on T-Jet tips is between a fine and a coarse, not very coarse or ultra coarse. Got it? And uh, on Wilger, again, everything runs a little finer, so there, there what we have found is between a fine and a very coarse. All right. Um, the last thing that Sam touched on was timing. We are working on the timing. Uh, what I have found extremely informative in our timing work is that um, we've always had this mantra that you have to apply inf before infection. Obviously you do. You don't get kickback action here, right? So you have to get the fungicide on before infection. And we knew that there was a great penalty to, to applying after you got white mold infecting. What I have found extremely informative here is the, the degree that we have learned of how much penalty you have to going on too early. And so this is really a dicey proposition because what we find is that we run these studies really asking the question, if your risk is really high, when do you pull the trigger? And so we, we, have, we, we spray the, our treatment, and then we wait two to three days to, till we go on for the next timing. And in between that, we irrigate hard to facilitate, make it such that if, you know, there's going to be infection, it, there's every window for it to happen. Okay, and, um, and, uh, and so this is basically your app, your white mold app is saying high, high risk, right? And um, when do you pull the trigger? What we have learned is that if, when you apply too early before there's any significant risk of infection, you can actually really hurt yourself. And if you think about this, this makes sense. Fungicides do not translocate into new growth. At early bloom, every one of us in this room, we all work with dry beans. We know how much vegetative growth those dry beans are putting on at early bloom. They're putting on lots. So if you apply your fungicide when there are 5 or 10% of plants with an open blossom and no dead blossoms at all yet, you're applying before you have any infection events, period. And in the four or five days before you have any significant dead blossoms out there, under most conditions, unless it's extremely hot, um, you know, you got a lot of additional vegetative growth. Remember that any additional vegetative growth after you apply your fungicide is not protected. Okay? And so, um, yeah, unfortunately, what this means uh, is that we have to be very, very good producers, and we have to be very timely in our applications. Okay, and so what we have found is that you need to look at the percent of plants with those initial pin pots as your target growth stage. Okay, those are actually, it's actually a proxy for dead blossoms. And then it all comes down to after that, how cool it is, how wet it is, and what your canopy closure is. Thanks. Michael, you've got a lot Sorry, you've got a lot of information. Do you want to tell them quickly where they might be able to see some of that, some of those updates? Well, first off, look at um, the upcoming uh, research issue that North Arf is putting out. Okay, you'll have a very good update there for our fungicide droplet size, uh, actually some spray volume work we've been doing too, and timing work. Uh, you can always go to the NDSU Carrington uh, website. Google NDSU Carrington Plant Pathology. Uh, I always post a research update at the end of the winter season. So right now, if you go there, you're going to find what I posted last March. This coming March, that'll all be updated, including new fungicide efficacy tables, okay, and summaries. So if you're interested in seeing how, you know, fungicide X has performed over the 15 or 20 times we've, we've, we've tested it, that's where you look. All right, thank you. So I think maybe one question. Do we have time for one question? Or am I get the gong here? Good? Okay. So I know I, at least I saw one hand up earlier. Do you still have a question you'd like to start with? Can you? Yeah, can you so the question that? is did we experiment with application pressure? No, we haven't done that. Um, we've, 
Okay, so we do this all with a PTO-driven R&D, sprayer, tractor-mounted, okay. Um, what we are doing, though, is we keep our, our driving speed constant and our spray volume constant. Uh, and all we modify is pulse width when we're using these T-Jet tips. Of course, Wilder, you don't, you don't have to change your pulse width because um, they, uh, they manufacture a lineup of tips that doesn't require that. But um, we've ended up having to just use whatever pressure uh, is necessary to get our necessary droplet with the you know, tip that um, uh, will give us our droplet size at the driving speed we can go. And so, uh, you know, and what I want to stress there is I, if you keep your pressures in the range that's recommended, you should be fine. So we're using extended range T-Jet tips, 110 degree uh, tips, and um, we keep it always between 30 and 60 PSI. And actually, our coarse droplets are being run at 30 PSI when the fines are actually at like 50 or 60, depending on the nozzle we're using. And so I, you know, you know, the size of the droplet has a lot more to do with how much velocity it has than, than necessarily the pressure you put it out on. What you want to make sure is you don't exceed 60 PSI with these typical, these traditional tips. Uh, air induction is another story, okay? Those you want at higher pressures. but what happens is you take a standard, a normal, say, extended range tip, and you, you shoot it out at like 70, 80 PSI. What you're going to end up doing is you're going to have a tail on your distribution with a lot of fines and, and very fines, even if the primary distribution is not centered on that. And that's not desirable. Yeah. So. All right. Well, I think we probably should wrap the, well, what do you think? Should we wrap? All right. One more. Quick. Gallons per acre. Gallons per acre. Ugh, gallons per acre. Okay, I've been really leery to talk about this one because it's <laughs> been uh, the results we've gotten have really blown me away. We're using the same methods that we're using in the droplet size studies. We do this. We use our pulse width modulation system, Capstan Ag, to keep our driving speed the same. Um, in this case, we keep our nozzles uh, the same. Now we're calibrating versus canopy closure. We've been testing now three years. 10, 15, 20, 25 gallons an acre. Tops and followed by Endura. 40 fluid ounces followed by eight ounces of Endura. And um, we haven't seen a response to spray volume. Um, mm -mm, nothing. Uh, we just followed this up on soybeans with white mold. Um, five to 15 gallons an acre on soybeans. After our driving experience, we thought we'd see how low we can go. <laughs> and. Uh, it looks like we might be starting to see a response below 10 gallons an acre, but um, it's not as strong as I would have expected. Uh, there is some research that was done in Brazil uh, about eight years ago, uh, looking at 10.7 versus 21.4 gallons an acre. Uh, three different nozzles, two different fungicides. They saw no, no response to spray volume for white mold management. Okay, wow. are we going to find an exception to that? I don't know. Perhaps. Um, at this point, um, that's what we're finding. I'm reticent to recommend it. Okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you, everyone. I'd like to emphasize one thing that Malika said, that the researchers here would like to hear from you. They like to hear from you. So interact with them. Tell them what's going on in your farm. And with that, I thank you very much, and thank you for having us.